Welcome to the Scale the Stride podcast, the place where you come to listen to some of the world's most influential leaders of the SaaS industry. I'm your host, Adam Richardson, and today I'm pleased to welcome Eva Maria Elia, who leads the channel log at Lookout. Lookout is a cloud security vendor with revenues in excess of over $100 million, backed by the likes of A16Z, Axel, Index Ventures, and Greylock, just to name a few. Starting as their third employee in EMEA, Eva has a lot of experience to share from her journey at Lookout, and here are some of my key takeaways. How to build out a scalable channel-led go-to-market strategy, how to continually evolve your model to monopolize the market you operate in, but managing a busy work life and family life, and lots of great advice around making your application stand out when you're applying for a new role. You'll notice when listening to this episode that Eva is incredibly humble, but don't let that fool you. Her achievements throughout her career are incredible and someone I hold in high regard. Let's dive in. Ava, so thank you very much for, for joining us today. I've been I've been really looking forward to, to today's conversation. Um, I suppose for, for the listeners' benefit, it'd be great if we could, I suppose, start off by introducing yourself, tell us a little bit about your role, uh, the business that you're working at, um, and just a bit of an overview of your career so far. Hi, Adam. Very good to have that chat with you. Um, so hi, everybody. My name is Eva Maria Elia. I was born, raised, and went to school and university in Germany. I love to spend time with my family, be outdoors. As I told you, I've just been back from a nice hiking and bicycle vacation, which was lovely. I started my career for a very large multinational corporation, selling hardware and software to mainly carriers uh, and other segments as well. After eight years, I then accepted a job at a security startup called Lookout, with just 140 employees at the time, which, which was quite a change coming from a really large uh, corporate organization um, with a French culture, by the way, um, to a, a US-based uh, startup mentality. That also meant for me personally that I had to move to London um, because I was employee number three as part of the EMEA team. And altogether, we built the EMEA business basically from scratch. Um, at Lookout, I held then several roles in sales from establishing strategic partnerships, uh, direct SMB sales, vendor alliance management, to then EMEA channel director. And now I'm the VP global, cha global channel and MSSP. And for those of you who don't know what Lookout is, it's a cybersecurity company, we're SaaS only, and we also have an indirect go-to-market motion only. And thankfully, I had the opportunity to hire some great people to my team, which is how we've met. Good stuff. Well, thank you for that. Um, I suppose, yeah, it's really interesting to get some context, particularly on your journey with Lookout, you know, starting... A bit with a business at 140 employees being the third employee in EMEA. Um, I imagine that when you joined, there was, you know, very little to work with having to build, you know, from the ground up. So I think, you know, it'd be interested just to, to sort of give us a little bit of insight into what it's like to be, you know, the third person on the ground in it, you know, in a huge territory, particularly a territory like EMEA, which is, you know, it's not only so vast, but also has so many different nuances. What What was that like for you? Right. And being a U.S. headquartered company and then starting the EMEA business from scratch, it was also um, a challenge in the sense that we could reuse some of the things from our corporate team in the U.S., but a lot of things are very different in the EMEA market. And especially when it comes to um, an indirect go-to-market channel motion, because it's much more mature than it is in the U.S. So what we've done is we had to understand our sales cycle and decision making process first of all who are we selling to who is the decision maker uh, who is the in, who is the decision maker influenced by who are the types of partners that they work with um, and understanding your ecosystem so in the case of lookout for example it's a it was an only mobile endpoint security company at the time we then moved on to become a cloud security company as well and extended our portfolio but at the time we knew very early on that we had to play in that ecosystem of mobile device management, identity access management, other endpoint security vendors, because oftentimes the decision maker 
uh, is also tasked to implement the mobility strategy or the endpoint security strategy. And with that, they were, of course, also working with the appropriate partners who have already implemented together with the client the mobility strategy, for instance. Um, so it did make sense for us to play in that same ecosystem because you could talk about upselling, you had better access to those decision makers. And secondly, it's, it's really a strategic company decision whether you want to go direct to your clients or you want to go indirect um, and build a channel. And in the case of Lookout, and I'm very grateful that we've taken that decision to be an indirect go-to-market motion only, that decision was taken at the CEO level because it's really not just something that needs to be decided within sales. It affects your p &L, it affects your products, it affects your services your operations, your marketing strategy, marketing strategy, really everything. And once we've decided that we want to take an indirect go-to-market approach, it was also important to remind ourselves to stick to it as well. And we've seen other companies that we worked with in that ecosystem who told the world that they would go indirect only to market as well. But as soon as you start taking deals direct, then for whatever reason, it's going to be really hard to recover that trust uh, with your with your partner ecosystem. So that that was a, a big learning for us, and thankfully we never deviated from that indirect um, strategy. And we're very proud to be working with our our big channel community. What I would also say is that the 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 partner or the go to market ecosystem has become much more complex over the times. There is now a growing demand for managed services. Companies are outsourcing lots of IT and especially cybersecurity because they don't have their own internal staff anymore. So there is a growing demand to give that in the hands of somebody like a managed service provider. Um, there are also marketplaces, the hyperscalers, Amazon Marketplace, Microsoft, Google. Uh, so that changed the that changed the, the, the market as well because um, a couple of years ago, nobody was buying anything from, from an Amazon marketplace, but that is now the case. Um, so it was also important for us to manage the rules of engagement, understanding the go-to-market, which partner plays which role. So we could also avoid uh, channel conflict in our go-to-market strategy um, and maintaining a, a happy partner community um, so to say. And it's it's also more complex in the sense that a customer is touched by so many different influences, while, for instance, they would give an assessment of a solution, let's say, to a consulting firm to, do, to, to screen the market, see which vendors are out there. Then they would go to an SI or value-added reseller to do the actual project, to do the implementation, to go and do the sourcing of it. Um, then when it comes to the actual purchasing, they may purchase through a marketplace because they made a commit uh, to one of the hyperscalers or they buy through a dedicated software license house. Um, and ideally, as a SaaS company, you work with all of those different players and you understand really well where the touch points are in which part of the sales cycle. If you don't understand that, I think it's going to be very challenging um, to build your go-to-market appropriately. I, I wanted to I wanted to ask like go, go, sort of really going back to the beginning there like what what drove that that decision to go you know purely indirect because I suppose you, you do relinquish quite a lot of control in terms of how you're selling and how much you're selling. I think from a direct sales motion you've got control you know what activity and inputs you're putting and what the outcomes are but through the channel, through MSSPs, you are also relying on a third party and their ability and their performance and their buy into your product. And, and it, there's a lot of, of elements which you don't really have a huge amount of control over. So what what was the initial thought process, you know, from when you joined from the CEO to say, let's go for the indirect model? Absolutely. And it's also a cost associated with it as well. Right? So yeah, you're giving away some of your margin. It's a it's a big investment overall for for a company. No, but it's it's just it's one it's a scalability um, uh, question because if you are starting in the market, you're a startup with just 140 employees, and you started adding 
a few salespeople in a big a region like EMEA, you can either decide to hire 200 salespeople, which is going to cost you a lot of money, or you can decide to do a really good job in training the trainer and um, building that scale in the market by, by developing a, a partner community. And it's also a matter of a lot of clients, they trust their partner of choice. Um, so it's, it, it just made sense for us to play in that ecosystem that was out there already because it, mobile security was not something that had a, any market penetration at the time we started. We basically shaped that market as a, as a company. But there were other solutions out there that like mobile device management that allowed an organization to have some level of control over the mobile devices. Um, think about BYOD, that trend only just started um, at the time, look what came to market. Um, and there were a lot, a lot of players in that market already that we, we decided to benefit from because they knew that ecosystem much better than, than we did as a new player. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we, we hugely benefited from, from that knowledge that that partner community gave us. And we learned a lot. I mean, we also did summits and twice a year training sessions uh, and workshops and partner advisory boards because, and it's still today a really important component for us to learn from the market not just directly from our customers, but also from, from that partner community. So it's scalability, um, it's knowledge and feedback, um, and fa a faster go-to-market. And I want to talk about that, the enablement piece in just a second, but the with the big wins and the scalability, and I suppose like, you know, by plugging into a big, uh, you know, someone within the channel, like a, a really solid pa uh, partner, you get like immediate access to an entire portfolio of customers and you've got a champion of your product that are going to try and push that into to those customers. But on the flip side of that, if you lose a partner, you also have a potential like big risk. Do you, do you know what I mean? So like, how have you managed to like make sure you've got a really good spread we had, uh, we also had a sales, or we still have also a sales organization. So it's it's a lot about co-selling as well, and of, and you have a different level of maturity. You don't treat everybody the same way, um, and I think it's it's still. You, you mentioned level of control. I think it's always important to maintain a certain level of control, um, because you want to have a pulse directly with your customers and on the market and we certainly have that as well it's not like we're we're only um working with our partners we also do speak to customers directly of course um but it's it's always a fine line because you it's co-selling you want to trust each other you want to collaborate and work with each other yeah okay and as you mentioned, third person in EMEA. And from my understanding, when you joined, it was still a B2C product. Um, and from conversations that we've had, you were responsible for one of the first deals in EMEA. And I think they're still a customer today, if if, if I remember, if my memory serves me right, uh, Eva. Um, I suppose, yeah, like for, for people listening to this um, who are, you know, within, specifically within the same space, within the channel and how... What were the like first steps you started to make in terms of like building the channel out? You know, to, to come in an organization new to the product, a B2C, converting that into a B2B product, building out a channel. Um, there seems like so many huge hurdles to overcome in one go. Um, you know, first being like product market fit, for example. Um, but how, how do you then go from having a, a B2C product to a B2B product to then building out a channel from completely from scratch it seems like conquering Everest um sat here at the minute so let's start with uh with the product and and product market fit so you're right we it was b2b to c actually so we had um it, it's still it's still we also had b to c directly but um when I mean what I mean by B2B2C is we were working with some of or we are still working with some of the largest network operator in the world like Deutsche Telekom, AT&T, Verizon, Vodafone. Um, and they bundle some of their services or rate plans with a mobile security plan from Lookout. 
So we had those strategic relationships with them early on, um, taking that to consumers, to people like you and I who buy, who go into a shop, who buy a phone and who can download the app or get it from your network provider. Um, but we also realized that it's not just something that a, a regular person needs, but also organizations. Um, because if you have a corporate phone that you give to your employees to read their emails and to check their calendars and um, and and use their travel expense apps or CRM apps, then you want to make sure that there is a, pro- a certain level of protection on it as well. You also put an AV software on your on your computer. It's not like as an organization you don't have any kind of security on your on your laptop. You have to have the same on on your on your mobile phones. And because we had a huge installed base of and customers who were using the Lookout app already. Um, it was an easier uh, job for us. And we had the knowledge as well to build an enterprise product. And then it was just a lot of listening. We were talking to a lot of early customers, understand what, what is it that they wanted? What do they need from an administration point of view? What did, do they need from an operational point of view? Which is not something that you're regular consumer needs they just need an app and that's it but if you're talking about an, an a whole organization there are other features and functionalities that that are important and then from a how do we take that product to to market perspective it was the same thing it was just a lot of listening um who do you manage how do you manage it who do you trust who do you buy from who do you rely when it comes to implementation of of such a product um and we also realized that a lot of those network operators that we worked with, um, they, of course, serve B2B as well. They serve SMBs, they serve uh, large enterprise. So we already had access to them and we sat down with them and we listened to their needs and, and how they take the product to market. But they also have an ecosystem of other partners that they work with. Um, so again, I talk a lot about ecosystem. This is a, such a connected world and such a small world as, as well. So it, it is really important to know who is the the who is who and and who do you work with and and who do organizations trust to work with in that ecosystem and and that's what we've done we 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 had a lot of conversations we captured a lot of feedback um, and then there was trial and error of course as well so we um, we didn't do everything right in the beginning but we were agile we were flexible to adopt our our strategy as well and. Um, it was a lot about upselling too. I, I talked about upselling as well. Um, so what was our path of least resistance? Who are the clients that our, op- our network operators, for instance, are serving already? Um, is there a conversation to be had? How do they protect their, their corporate devices? Um, and that's how step-by-step step, um, we built that business. And knowing what you know now, and having all the the you know the battle scars to show for it over the years of, of 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 doing what you've achieved, how do you think you would have have approached it? Like you know, at the time you're a single product vendor. Now you've moved like out and out into that sort of cloud security player with multiple products, multiple offerings. How do you think that like having such a more of a complex product would have ad- added complexity to to the challenge that you faced of building it from scratch? I think it 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 was definitely. Uh more straightforward to have a, a single product and to be able to focus on that because there is already enough complexity um, with the different players in the market uh, for sure and it has also become more complex for us today um, yeah. but that's also that's also the what I love about the company and the job, there's always a new challenge. Um, almost every year we reinvented ourselves. We added something else to the portfolio. Um, we created another OEM relationship, for instance, which is not something that we've talked about yet. Um, so it's it's become much more complex uh, for sure. And there's always a need for us to sit down and think about how do we have to extend our go-to-market strategy? Is it still the same? Do we have to change something? Do we have to update the program do we have to serve the need of different players that that are now playing a role where they haven't played a role before to give you one example um, professional services 
has not played such an important role for us in the beginning when we came to market, but is playing playing a, a huge role today. Um, and that poses different challenges on your partner program as well, because if you want partners, which you definitely do, to be involved in providing professional services or hosting services, then it's a different level of education, different level of training. You need to provide certification programs. Um, the level of control becomes a different, a totally different story as well, because previously we only talked about selling but now you're also talking about implementing and maintaining and, and servicing a solution. And that's something that has definitely become much more complex and, and challenging now that we have a full platform suite and not just a point product. Yeah. And it's important. Otherwise, you know, you're going to end up having high, you know, high churn. One of the, um, you know, if, if, if I'm, if I'm in another business and I'm doing a similar kind of role to what you're doing now and, you know, we've just made an acquisition or we've just developed a new product and we're about to take that to our, our, our partners, what advice would you be giving to, to another leader in your position on, on introducing new products to market um, and how you then enable your partners to be selling a full suite or multi-product? How, how, what experience have you had and what advice would you give? Yeah, it's basically a repeat of what you do when you enter a market with a product for the first time. Um, you, you, you would do the same level of analysis, understanding if the sales, ci sales cycle is the same or is it different? Uh, what components yeah. do you have? Is it resell? Is it managed service? Is it hosting? Is it professional services? Is it more complex or is it straightforward? Um, so you determine, can I have it same as part of the same bucket or do I have two different streams because it's not really the same? Ideally, you can combine it within the same motion or, this, or the same program. And then, of course, also, do I have to address different types, different types of partners? Like, for instance, a large system integrator, you work with much differently than if you, if you work with a um, a marketplace or a vendor alliance partner. You, they have different needs. They have different requirements when it comes to training. They can or cannot serve different parts of your sales cycle. They may not even be interested in reselling the licenses. They may, may only be interested in hosting or they may only be interested in, in professional services. So try to understand the different components and if there's something you need to add or you need to remove or even have different streams as part of your program to make sure that you serve all these different important touch points and different important types of partners um, for what's important to them. Ask yourself, what is it, what's important to them? What do they need in order to help you and help the client? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for that. And so, so Ava, you've, you, you've been at Lookout for 10 years. You've had multiple promotions throughout your time there you've you've achieved a whole lot it'd be good to to sort of hear a little bit around i suppose some of like the key initiatives that you've that you've driven within the business that have that have really helped move the needle for lookout and and then more importantly like which ones have you like have you really enjoyed the most and 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 that you're really proud of so i take the most recent one um so the most recent one is in april we launched our managed service provider program. And the reason why I choose that is because you may think it's just an additional component, but it's it's not. It really affects, again, the whole company. And previously, we've only done reselling, right? So we are reselling of our services, reselling of our products. But with the growing demand of managed services in the market, we also decided to serve managed service providers much better with a dedicated program. So we had to reshape and reorganize our entire go-to-market. Um, and it's really things like the pricing is different. Um, we had to describe what type of services is it exactly that an MSSP can take to their clients um, we needed to provide a new training and certification program because the managed service provider does the level one and two support for our services. Now, we are only in the background. We oftentimes don't even know who the end customer is. So again, we, 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 we're getting 
we're going in the background. Uh, we're trusting those managed service providers to manage the whole solution end to end based on our product. Um, so we're giving away more control, but it also means that we have to give out more information. We have to make sure that those partners work much more closely with our security team, because if you manage a security solution as a managed service provider, you need to know exactly what's going on in the threat uh, landscape, what, who are the new threat actors. It's important that we have very close alignment um, between the managed service provider with our security research team. Um, we had to come up with new uh, with new offerings. We had to we have a different P and L at the end of the day because there is a different cost uh, and margin uh, involved. Um, and we also had to change the product. We had to make the product available so that an organization can create a new environment for a customer without having to go through us. Um, we had to make sure that they can download their consumption reporting. The commercial model is different. So even though I thought I knew everything about that company already and how the processes work, I can tell you I probably learned more in the last six months than I did in the nine years before. It sounds like just building a whole new business from scratch again. <laughs> it is. It is. It is. It is. It is an entirely new go to market uh, motion. And that was a lot of fun. Um, because I got to know people in the organization much better um, that I didn't work with much uh, closer. And the team had so much fun. I mean, it was so much fun and uh, creating that and understanding it and what needed to be done. Um, everybody was super motivated. Um, and the success that we had so far showed that it was absolutely the right decision to go down that route. Yeah. So it sounds like, you know, not only was it a huge initiative, something that you've enjoyed, but also from a like growth and personal development perspective, it's it's had a big, big part in that. I suppose, is there anything else that is really like jumps out at you in terms of like steep learning curves, challenges that you've you've faced over the last 10 years? Yeah, talking about learning curve, uh, one thing that I've realized, it's one thing I mean, you step up from an individual contributor to your first managing a team role. That's one thing. But if you then manage managers, that's a whole other conversation. And uh, for somebody that is very passionate about their job and wanting to do their best, um, it's really, it, it was a tougher learning curve for me to completely take myself out of the day-to-day -day business and trust um, the person to manage other individual contributors. I think that for me was the biggest learning curve probably to, to live and be able to trust that person to do things your way, which is really, um, yeah, something I guess that, that you have to learn. You've always hired very well though, haven't you, Eva? <laughs> um, I had uh, really good advice. <laughs> no, but it, it's it's true. I think it's it's uh, it, that's another learning, right? Um, that you always hire the best, um, and it's very true because if you have the best people, um, everybody wins in that situation. It makes you look good as a manager, but it also makes everybody uh, happy, and you can learn from each other. Um, yeah, I still remember the, the best interview I ever had with a candidate that you referred to be. She came on the interview and she said, hey, hi, it's good to finally meet you. I feel like I know you already because I've watched all of your interviews and all of your webinars and all of your podcasts. And then I think you know who I'm talking about. And then she she basically asked me 45 minutes, lots of challenging questions about the business and and how her role would look like um, and how her MBOs will be structured and how her commission plan would be structured and how success looks like and, and what I want her to achieve in her first three months, six months um, and about the product and about the solution and our goals as a company, lots of questions. And I, I knew after a very short period of time that she would be the perfect fit because she prepared herself so well and she was asking all the right questions. Because um, you can just see from the type of questions that somebody is asking whether they are structured enough and they have the capacity to see themselves in that role already. And they have a plan for how they approach it. And um, we have very 
we have a need for people to be very self-sufficient and very senior. They have to manage their own markets and their own regions. Um, so that was also really good learning for me is uh, without asking too many questions, um, you learn a lot by just listening to the questions that the candidate has. Yeah. And from experience of working with you, uh, you know, from a recruitment perspective, you've always been extremely committed um, and very conscientious about everything that you do. And after listening to the, you know, what we've just been talking about for the last 20 minutes or so, um, it's really opened my eyes to the amount of work that you, you know, that you're involved in and I, I suppose like the, the workload that you have and, you know, knowing you on a personal basis with, you know, having also a busy family life with your nice trips to Austria with your family, like how do you manage to, to juggle both? Time management, time management, time management, time management. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, so it's, um, it's, uh, I'm still not perfect. I'm still looking for advice if if somebody <laughs> has any additional ideas how to manage that. But being in a in a global role, working for a global company and having a family, it's it's really about structure and time management for the most part. Like for instance, I I block time for all the things that are important to me in my calendar very diligently. So and that's for me dinner every evening with the family I, I block time I block time it says literally says no meetings from 10 p.m to 8 30 a.m and anything else that I need to do like a doctor's appointment dentist appointment or picking up the kids or a block for an hour of going outside or, or any sports classes and I do very few of them um, I block time so Everybody knows that they can use the remainder um, to book meetings. And I found that the most sufficient way. Um, so I can make sure that I do the things that are important to me that I want to do. But at the same time, people know where they can get time with me. And uh, of course, I do a traveling as well. Um, my husband does travel from time to time as well. Luckily, not as much. But we have to be super tightly aligned on who is traveling when so at least one of us is at home um so we combine our calendars um, and plan a lot ahead of time and luckily we have help from from parents and friends as well and then it also means that you have to say no or yes to the important things ask yourself am i really needed in that meeting if um if you're double booked or um is there somebody else that can can manage it as well giving away some of that control as well and only focus on the things that are really important and are strategically important as well because it's always easy to be distracted in the easy things but you need to block time as well to think strategically about what what is it that i have to tackle that i have to approach and 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 get done and the last thing i would say be prepared if there is an important deadline I have to hit or or presentation, say in two or three days. Um, I always make sure that I'm ready a few days ahead of that because if your kid wakes up the next morning with a high fever, you're completely screwed if you were planning to prepare for that presentation on that day. So it's it's um it's always being prepared and and don't leave it to the last minute you need to be just much more structured and and focused to get things done that, that's all like re really good advice i think blocking time out and being disciplined with that as well and sticking to it and and knowing when's yours and your family's time and when's work time because you know you've got a big role big responsibility multiple time zones multiple people reporting into you one of the things that I often struggle with as well is, is not just the time, but also like actually being present. So you might physically be there, but your mind's elsewhere. Like what, what do you do in terms of like actually switching off so that you are present at those times? So um, you mean at home? Yeah. Or like, you know, on your holidays, your, your family time, like if you block in time out for, for, for family time and then you bang straight onto another meeting in the evenings up until 10 o'clock. How are well, you making sure you're present? Well, if you knew my kids, you wouldn't ask that question because they <laughs> they demand my full attention the moment yes. I leave my office. 
Um, no, but choking aside, I, I do think it it, it helps. Um, it helps because they are young; they are still young, um, and they demand the attention. But but it's also we also plan again the the planning aspect of it. We also plan quality time ahead. Uh, so for instance, on the weekends, we know ahead of time what, what we will do, plan any outdoor activities or going away over the weekend. So everybody is aware that this is coming up um, and we've planned for it and we stick to it and, and we do it and we're committed to doing it without any um, mobile phone distraction. And I think continental Europeans do that a lot better than the English and especially the Americans. Because every oh, yeah. time I speak to Judith, she's always got amazing things planned with her boys as well. So it's, um, yeah. I oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm talking with my manager about that all the time. I said, you don't have to worry about uh, my work-life balance because I'm very serious with my PTO, with my vacation. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Cool. Well, well, one of the other things I really wanted to talk to you about was was around like leadership in your principles. I think, again, going back to the point that myself and the team, we've recruited for you. We've we've worked with you, you and, and your wider team for a long period of time now. And, and one of the things that's you know not only unique just to yourself, but also I think to the leadership at, at, at Lookout in general is around like really solid principles and values and the kind of individuals that you recruit within the business. Um, And that's evident with when you just look at simple things like tenure within the business, the average tenure of the reps, of the individuals, the individual contributors, the leadership. um, It's very indicative of the culture and the values that yourself and Wim and GJ and all the other leaders have have, have created, particularly in EMEA. Um, But it'd be good to understand from your perspective, like what what are those fundamental principles that you believe in and that you, you, you live by as a leader? So Wim likes to say sometimes that we have a really great leadership team because we manage our egos really well. Um, we don't have that. Yeah. We have not. No, we don't have big egos, and I think that's very true. That goes along with being humble, because um, the leader is not the most important person. It's it's always the team. We always put the team first, and and. Um, try to hire the best people that that we can get um, even though they're smarter than us uh, better than us and more experienced than us um, and I think that that makes a big part of of our culture um, give them what they need and, and listen and be very humble um, also never assume um, I, I uh, learned that as well um, be understanding explain don't assume that everybody is at the same level of of knowledge um, and then also communicate and expect um, communicate communicate your expectations and give feedback. Just be very honest and and direct. I, I try to maintain that very open and honest and transparent dialogue with everybody on my team, so they know what they know exactly what to expect of me, and and they also know that I will immediately give them feedback or tell them if there's something that is not up to up to expectations and. Um, it's also about addressing the elephant in the room. It doesn't. It really doesn't get better in my experience. Um, so if there's anything um, that you know you feel like you need to address, always do it directly because the other person for sure will notice that something is wrong. Um, so maintaining that open line of communication and be transparent and honest is super super important in 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 my mind. Uh- and that that again is um without like sweeping generalizations of like definitely um consistent with a lot of like other German leaders that we work with, particularly leaders in the Netherlands as well. You know, the Dutch are renowned for their direct communication and their honesty, um, and not shying away from I suppose uncomfortable conversations. And it's, it seems like that's a a culture that's been fostered within your teams and within Lookout. But like most importantly, that it's coming from a place of love and, and like um, like it's genuine and meant meant with with good intention. Um, but it's really good to like actually hear you articulate your own values because I think um, you know if we were to describe to a candidate that was about to interview, you know, it's, it's it's really good to be able to to hear from yourself what the what they actually are. Um, so yeah, so thank you for that. Um, 
We touched on very briefly, you mentioned around hiring um, and you're referring to, uh, to to one of our friends. What um, I suppose, yeah, like it'd be good to for, for individuals listening to this this episode, just advice that you'd give for, from, a, from a hiring perspective, you know, if, you know, if you're building your CV, you want to make your profile stand out. And as, as a hiring manager, you know, you screen a lot of CVs, you screen a lot of candidates when you're interviewing, like what are the things that are, that really jump out to you that's going to really enable someone to, to increase the chances of securing a role? And I think in today's market, like this is so relevant, um, given all the layoffs that have happened over the last 18 months. Um, being able to give some advice to someone that might be watching this thinking, right, you know, I can take some advice for this for my next interview or the next application that I'm making. Right. And there's there's a lot of advice on that topic on LinkedIn and other places. And a lot of them say the same, but I cannot emphasize that enough. The only two things that are relevant for the hiring manager or the recruiting manager is How is your experience relevant to us and why should we hire you? And all this, all CVs in my mind are still the same. So if you're screening 20 CVs per hour, um, it, A, it gets super boring if they're all the same. Um, and you're basically listing everything that you've ever done, um, thinking, oh, maybe I've forgotten something here, maybe I've forgotten there. If you're a candidate, take a blank paper and a pen and write down how is my experience relevant for company A, B, and C, and why should you hire me? Write down bullet points, three per, per question, and just upload that. That, to me, if I would have received such a paper, I would have definitely um, invited uh, such a candidate for the first interview because, A, it's unique, it's creative. I haven't seen anything like that before. B you see that this candidate has written that explicitly for you and for your company. They're helping you translate your CV in a way to what is relevant to the company. Because that's all what you, that's all you want. The candidate is basically doing the work for you. They're translating their CV because the CV is just a list of all the accomplishments that, that somebody has done. But how do you tr translate that to the company? It's basically an executive summary. And I know some people do Uh, summaries of their background, which is definitely helpful as well, because that's normally about everything uh, you read if you have so many CVs that you have to screen in a short period of time. Um, so the advice is translate your CV to what is relevant um, and be creative. Yeah. I normally say to candidates, get your CV, fold the first page in half. If you're not convincing the person by the time you've Uh, read the first half of your CV, you're probably going in the no pile. Yes. Um, cool. Okay. What um, what 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 advice would you give to people that are like looking to to get more out of their career and looking to to develop themselves? Like, there's no shying away from the fact, and and you are incredibly humble about this, Eva. Um, the success that you've had, you know, prior to Lookout, but also at Lookout, you know, third in EMEA, building a business from scratch the progression that you've had, the career trajectory that you've had within that organization and the success the organization's had as a whole and you being you know, a really key driving force behind that, you've got a lot of, a lot of success to shout about and, and wisdom to share. Like what, what advice would you be giving to people in the market that you know, maybe someone's a little bit stagnant in the role and looking for something new or maybe someone's you know, one of that typical top performer in the business that's reached the, that, that ceiling that just doesn't know what or how to then push on that, that to that next phase of, of growth? Like what, what advice would you be giving people? If I had to summarize it in one line, I would say own it and do it. Right, okay. And, and what I mean by that is sometimes it, so let's say in that example where you're an individual contributor and you're doing a really good job, you're, you're at the maximum, um, you, you, you can't basically exceed um, any expectations in that particular role. Sometimes it just again, needs a little creativity um, and just doing it. Because uh, oftentimes um, leadership may not see themselves. That's also that don't assume, own it, make suggestions. Um, if you're seeing 
a certain direction that the company should go or a certain direction that your role should develop into. Just do it and communicate about it um, and make suggestions for how your role could grow or make suggestions for a certain new function that um, the leadership organization or the organization could establish um, to make things better and what the company can benefit from. So a lot of times where I've had success um, and, and been promoted is where I've seen a gap and I've gone ahead and, and started with it. I've gone ahead and, and done it. And I tried to find solution for a particular problem. And I helped um, my team, my management team understand why I think we should go into that direction and, and build a plan, show them how you would do it, help them visualize it and what would the benefits be of, of going that route. Um, and if it makes sense, there is not a lot of reasons why uh, the management team or the leader should say no to it, if it makes sense from a, from a, from a company perspective. And, you know, don't, don't, again, don't assume um, everybody is, is and should be in control of their own career and you need to communicate about what you want as well. But don't just stop at the communication and what you want, but also make suggestions. Own it and do it. That's um, that's the biggest advice um, I would I would give somebody. And be a team player. Nobody likes lonely wolves. Um, even even if you may not directly benefit from it, uh, collaboration is key as well. That's what every organization wants to see and is what makes you more successful at the end of the day. Yeah. I think I, going back to your point about owning it, I I, I do I, I completely agree, and that that really resonates with me. I think when you when you're early on in your career, a lot of your development, the onus is on is your on your direct leader. You know, it's there to to develop you, to coach you, to train you. But once you get to a certain level of experience and mastery within your craft, that like next stage of development and growth, you have to take accountability for it. You can't always be looking to someone else to say, make me better. It's like, what what ownership are you having on going out and, um, you know, in terms of like research, development, challenging yourself, seeking opportunities and gaps and and, and going for it rather than always waiting for instructions. So I think that, that um, I really, yeah, it really resonates with me. Um, particularly where I've got individuals within within my business who are you know as senior as, as, as they can go in terms of the current business size that we're at, um, and my time is spread quite thin. So it's like in terms of your development, there's there's only so much you can get from 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 myself. What are you doing to go out and find that yourself and 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 continue to find further purpose and meaning within the work that you're doing? Um, so yeah, I, I agree with your point there. Um, Cool. I suppose in terms of um, bringing things to a close, I think, you know, we've had a, a really good conversation here, Eva. It's um, it's amazing to hear in more detail some of the stuff that you've you've achieved at, at Lookout and throughout your career around your, your leadership um, principles and um, and some of your values as well. Um, I think more on a like a personal note to, to, to bring the conversation to a close, like it'd be good to understand just a little bit around, you know, yourself and what are you doing when you're not um, when you're not selling? You know, you mentioned about your, your, your trips to Austria, but yeah, what? Tell me something about yourself that you know I, I probably wouldn't know. Something that you wouldn't know about me. So yeah, I, most, uh, tell me something either I won't know or most people wouldn't know about you. Most people won't know about me. So um, so I actually love gardening. I think that's right, okay. something, something that. Most people really don't know. Um, while I'm, I'm always on the active side and, and you know, outside and, and doing sports and making sure that my kids don't have any energy left at the end of the day. Um, so gardening is really something that helps me calm down, especially, uh, you know, in the evening of, of a summer day, just cutting. It's the key to a long life, you know, that is. <laughs> so have you, have, you heard of, have you heard of Blue Zones? Uh, no. So it's research into zones all throughout the globe of where they have the most heavily populated or heavily concentrated population of centurions. So people that have lived over 100. And in all these random parts of the world, they like analyze the habits and the lifestyles of those individuals. And gardening was one of them that came up. Light, 
consistent extended exercise on a regular basis is a key to becoming a centurion so keep it up so, so you know I'm, I'm growing i'm growing peppers cucumbers tomatoes raspberries blueberries uh, cherries uh, strawberries uh, in my garden and it's so rewarding i can only recommend it to everybody <laughs> Good stuff. Good stuff. Well, well, listen. I think um, I'll definitely be be asking for a few samples the next time I trip uh, come over to Germany. So uh, you'll have to put a few aside. But listen, I've really enjoyed this um, this conversation. I'm sure the listeners are gonna gonna take a lot of value from it. Um, so thank you very much for for giving up your time and and sharing your story. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much, Adam. Enjoy talking to us always. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you want more information about the podcast, head over to our website, Scale With Stride.